All right, it's recording. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna continue our review of Desert or Paradise in just a moment. I'm I'm gonna just talk about a, a couple of things here real quick. Um, did you guys see the the pay it forward thing I attempted to do a couple of days ago? I did. I thought that was cool. Katie, I, now I'm here today with Opalin and Katie. And so, Katie, did you see the the pay it forward thing I attempted to do? Oh, no, I didn't. I was reading other things. Uh, sorry, I, okay. I didn't nope. see the email. So I, I, I tried to, um, basically, it's like, you know, Earth Day is just a few days away. And I kind of thought, oh, man, every Earth Day, I get bombarded with people telling me about all the great things to do on Earth Day, like buy crappy light bulbs or, um, you know, buy crappy crap crap you know or their their solutions are always about who to be angry at and things like that and i just kind of felt like oh i i because i'm getting all of this stuff um surely there you know i haven't reached enough people and so anyway i got this idea in my head that um like part of it was is that if if the building a better world in your backyard book uh, if it were to get into a million brains, I'm totally happy to let go of any profit whatsoever. Um, and so in the spirit of that, I kind of thought, well, what if I just make it free? And so I set up a thing for five days where it would be completely free. And I said, you know, and I, I sent out an email saying, please pass this on as much as you can and let's let's see if we can infect enough brains and, and all before earth day um uh the results are in it reached 520 people <laughs> not not 5 million <laughs> Five, 520 uh, and i just kind of thought oh and I just had these high hopes that it was going to do this big, big thing, and it, and it didn't. Um, but I mean, try 100 things, two will work out. You never know in advance which two. So that thing, it didn't really work out. It, did, it, did, it worked and it didn't. It, it, it did a little thing, but it didn't do a giant global change kind of a thing. Um, so, damn. Next thing up is that the Kickstarter is it is almost to eighty five thousand dollars. It has, it has come to a dead stop. It's it's like not moving at all right now. Um, and uh, uh, oh yeah, you're pulling it up so we can see it. Is it? Oh look, there's an update here for you. Um, so. One of the things that we're going to do is um, once it does hit 85,000, which could be today, uh, it could be, um, you know, in a few days or a week. It just moved. It did. It just now moved. Look at that. It's 84,352. Um, what we're going to do is uh, send out an update to let people know that, that we knocked out another stretch goal. Uh, I believe that'll take us up to. 15 stretch goals um, that, that have been hit. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to tell everybody that um, uh, if, you, if you're at the $65 uh, backer level or higher, that um, we're going to invite you to participate in a webinar or um, uh, basically just a Zoom call about the permaculture apples for Safeway. Thing. And, uh, um, and we'll, we'll hopefully put it to the podcast stream eventually. Uh, so we'll, we'll try that. Here, here's an interesting thing, and I'm going to share this thing, and maybe people will, um, you know, post comments on the podcast page or something to, to tell me uh, the answers to these things. Give me some clarity. But um, uh, with the Kickstarter, in, we've sent out several emails about it, and in one of the emails we said uh, we, we sent it out about the Kickstarter, 
and uh, 21,000 people opened the email. It went to 100,000 people. 21,000 people opened the email. And um, we have currently, I think, I think we have like uh, 1,700 backers right now, something like that. So 21,000 people opened it and we have less than 2,000 backers. And that's, that's like, okay, people could like come and look and be like, nah, don't wanna. Um, but here's the thing that kind of gets me is that only 2,200 people have watched the video. So like 21,000 people opened the email, but 90% of them didn't even look at the Kickstarter page, let alone the, the video. Um, I'm, I'm a little, a little baffled by that. Um, because I do feel like the skipbook stuff can be a little hard to understand. Um, so I, and I feel like the video does a really good job of, of clearing that up. Uh, I have a question. Oh, yes, Katie. I'm not remembering exactly the email because I, I look at them and then I look at a different email. But this, I feel like it's possible that it, there, that you could put like a, exactly what we're seeing now, basically, not the stuff on the right, but the picture of the video with a little play button. In, and like, so they see the video and they could click on it and it would like play the video, link to the video, you know, directly. Is that, is that something that could be put in your email or is that like too hard for the system or was it there and I just forgot? I am thinking that it might be good um, for one of our upcoming emails that go out to make a link to like the YouTube video, which for most people, they'll kind of, it'll display the, the YouTube thumbnail um, and maybe that'll help. Maybe it'll make a difference. Um, Could you do it right to the Kickstarter? Not really, maybe? Well, we've provided a link to the Kickstarter with each of the emails, but in the particular email I'm talking about, there was a link to the Kickstarter. Um, well, I, mean, I mean, the video that like takes them to the Kickstarter video. I'm just saying oh. sometimes we used to have to really like, some people are a little distracted, so you have to hand whatever you want them to do on a, a, a very silvery platter, just <laughs> so that like it was it was very very close to being able to be grabbed and eaten. And so, if they're already on the Kickstarter page, they're just a little bit closer. No, no, you're you're right, and um, uh, all of all of our mail stuff at Permes is uh, set up to do strictly text only, right now. And um, I mean, we could, we have talked about transitioning to something that's being as HTML, but it was uh, a few years ago that the HTML based emails uh, were considered to be more likely to be spam. And so we made the choice to stick to plain text. And then, uh, then it kind of got to be an edge case. And uh, we just, we just kind of felt like we liked the plain text better. So we stuck to plain text, but you're right. Um, a lot of people are used to getting images in their emails now. And if they don't have images, it's kind of like they, they, it's easier to, they just choose to ignore it. Like, nah, yeah, I, I didn't see anything colorful in there. So I'm going to ignore it. So uh, maybe that's something we gotta, we, we need to amend before the next Kickstarter, but um, we don't have a way of doing it. All right. The, th the thing is, of course, I would love for people to uh, to give me advice on how to do better at all of this. I, I just kind of found this little tidbit of information and and it really kind of blew me away. Um, you know, 21,000 people opened the email and only about 10% of those people, and for all time, in fact, that was 21,000 for one email and we've sent out several. And for all time, only 2,200 people have even watched the video. And so I'm just kind of thinking that's, that's mind boggling to me. But maybe people, maybe there'll be somebody who will help me to understand that, that they know more about it than I do. Uh, next thing is, is that uh, we have successfully expanded the boot camp. So for years, the boot camp was limited to six people. I think last year, we had a moment where we allowed this person and that person and this other person, and we had 17 people here, and it was just 
way too crowded. Um, and so what we've done is we've divided the boot camp into two boot camps, one up at the lab and one at base camp. And we're um, also we've also taken steps to further uh, divide the boot camp so that there could be three or even four different boot camps um, with multiple leaders and et cetera, et cetera. So we we are currently have the capacity to handle twenty or more boots in the boot camp very comfortably. Uh, That's final, amazing. Yeah, I, I'm feeling like this is a big accomplishment for us. I'm really excited about it. I'm really kind of feeling like it's going to help to um, move our forward velocity in a strong way. Oh, and here's a huge thing. Um, uh, somebody who is wishes to be anonymous, uh, you know, which will become clear why in a moment. Um, uh, loves the pictures and stuff in the boot camp and what we're doing and all that stuff and has put up thirty thousand dollars and and it's like uh, like they've actually sent that money to me and and i now have it and and it's for uh the brk um and so for the next three boots that get 700 brk posts they will get ten thousand dollars each um, wow yeah so if you've been here so basically what his thinking was is that after being in the boot camp for two years you get your acre and uh so he kind of thought well it'd be handy to have some money for you know tools and materials and things of that nature to to kind of get your start on your acre um and he enjoys the the brk posts so he has put up this, this enormous amount of money uh further um i uh, i'm currently paying 200 bucks a video for people who edit up videos who are in the boot camp they edit up videos for me to be used on my youtube channel and i'm hoping that that'll help to to get my youtube channel really rolling again but uh so the I just wanted to make a quick note that the boot camp has expanded and more than that um I'll, i recently sent out a thing on the uh the waiting list because the boot camp has a waiting list and um uh, there's like 30 people on the waiting list and i sent them all an email and i said who can be here in three weeks and one person replied so i kind of feel like um if a person felt like they wanted to race right out here to the boot camp and be out here right away that that is very plausible um, so i i kind of feel like this is a, a a really good time to be in the boot camp we we've got spots now because we've expanded it and there's lots of coin i mean right now i think most of the boot camp too this is another thing is that most of the people that are here in the boot camp now are going to be attending the summer events, PDC, uh, the PDJ, and uh, the skip event. And um, so they're going to be attending all of those. And so it's kind of like, well, don't we need to have some people still in the boot camp while this is happening? And so um, uh, I, I'm really hoping that we'll get a few more people in the boot camp. Uh, last item. Um, the permaculture, speaking of the PDJ, the, the permaculture technology jamboree is really panning out to be quite the uh the super event um we, it's i mean i think we we did record a podcast a year ago before the pandemic stuff and so uh and we and we canceled that event but um it's it's a we're going with the same general thing we've got a ton of instructors lined up 10 tracks of stuff um and uh, I don't know, I think that there's going to be probably something on the order of 100 like classes. Some of the things that are going on are going to be like this thing takes the full two weeks. And then um, I think there's a bunch of stuff where it's like two hours per thing. Um, so many different things going on at the same time. So. Um, I, I mentioned it because we are perpetually polishing it and working on it. We got like a new instructor lined up this week and and um, some of the 
uh, stuff is getting nudged around here and there and we're ordering all the materials and um, uh, I'm seeing some of the designs of some of the things that are going to be built during the event. Um, it just sounds like a massive, it's going to be, I, I, I feel like this is going to be the foundation for something much larger next year. This is, I'm just kind of feeling like this is the kind of event I really want to do every year. Like this will be the coolest. All right. Now, uh, you guys, if you guys don't have anything to say about any of that stuff, Kickstarter, Expanded Bootcamp, and PDJ. I'm ready I, to move into Desert of Paradise. What? Go ahead. Yeah, I just think it's super exciting. Like the um, PDJ is, I don't think I got that right. PTJ. Yeah. It has yeah. 10 different tracks. Like you can spend the whole two weeks working with the, the solar powered glass production. And I'm just like, wow. Or you can spend a lot of time in the skip track or the homesteading track and work on a lot of BBs if that's your focus. So there's just so many options. I think it's amazing. Um, I'll be there. I'm excited. I remember, I know one instructor has been saying something like, uh, uh, like he's, he's he, he, at the beginning when we first started talking about it, he really struggled with the format and, I, and the format goes like this. Um, Anybody who's here at any time can wander around to any of the things that are going on and um, they can uh, observe or participate in anything or they could even go sit on their butt somewhere and watch the clouds pass if they really want to. <laughs> and it's like, it's all good. So it's like, there will be 10 different builds happening simultaneously on every day and um, possibly even more. I mean, knowing the way a lot of these guys do stuff, but you just wander around to whatever seems interesting to you, whatever seems like a good time. And then that's going to be, and you could either just watch or um, you could visit with others, or you can jump right in. Now, one of the, one of the instructors was like, "Well, I, you know, I have like a half hour of safety course that has to happen before this, and what if they missed on the safety course?" And I said, "Oh no. If you're you're going to take this thing on, and then somebody new comes along and they haven't heard the safety thing, then you're going to have to, and they want to participate." You need to take a moment and guide them in through the proper safety, you know, and do it. but it's like, this guy's used to teaching classes with like 25 people. And I'm saying there's probably going to be at any one build at any one time, there's probably only going to be four to eight people. And so it's, it's not, it's not that hard. It, it'll be, it'll be a cakewalk. You'll see. Oh yeah. There's Opalin. There's a picture of Opalin right there. <laughs> Um, so, uh, um, it's like, you know, make it be safe, keep the safety at a hundred percent, you know, but you might have to, to, when a person will wander up and want to participate and say, you could you totally say, okay, we got to chat a little bit about safety stuff before you get going. Okay. And that's like, uh, but when you're doing just one-on-one, -on -one, it goes a lot faster. And so it won't be, it, it'll, it'll be cool. You'll see. <laughs> so, um, all right. Anything else about these three things before we go into desert or paradise? Nope. nope. Okay. All right. Before we start to review the stuff that we have read for today, I want to I wanna, uh, read a comment that appeared on YouTube. And... Um, uh, and so I believe that this person is addressing, because in our last podcast, we talked about my strategy for um, like my alternative to the monk. So I designed my alternative to the monk before I understood about Sep's monk. And I, I think it is plausible that there could be values to my design over the monk. But, you know, I, I kind of feel like I wish that, 
uh, Sepp would uh, take a moment to look at it and give me feedback other than catastrophe, which is, you know, <laughs> style. But usually the way I could tell that Sepp likes my idea is it shows up later in one of his books. <laughs> but uh, all right, the comment was so many problems with the middle drain. And so my design was, is that um, there would be a poly pipe with like a hundred holes drilled into it and it would be wrapped in a screen. Um, and then it would have uh, uh, a, a three foot long cord with a rock attached to the other end. And it would also have like a piece of poly pipe with, a, with air in it attached to it. So then the intake would be held at about three feet above the bottom of the pond. So many problems with the middle drain. Impossible to clean out without scuba gear. All right, so Katie and Oakland. Let's suppose, first of all, it plugged. Oh no, it, it plugged. Are you going to be able to get to it without scuba gear? Well, these ponds and lakes aren't 100 feet deep, and it's not permanently affixed. It's weighted with a rock, and it's designed to float at, at such a point in a lake that it's unlikely to encounter things that would clog it until the lake gets really low. I'm going to guess it's going to be about six or seven feet deep because it's not too far away from the dam. So it's six or seven feet deep. And yeah, it's just got a rock attached to it. As an inexperienced surface diver, I dove 10 foot on like my third try and retrieve something from the bottom of a swimming pool. <laughs> so no, I, I would say no need for gear. Okay, Katie? Well, the, the thing is that I think in your podcast, you mentioned that you have a hose that you can put in the lake and drain out some of the lake. So I probably wouldn't die for it. <clears throat> I probably would drain it until I could access it. There you go. Yeah, yeah, there's that too. Um, but let's, let's continue on and we'll circle back to this one about the scuba gear. Floating debris will clog it every fall. Okay, and, and I'm gonna say, no, uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, when you've got it at the top, like the monk, it's, it, that's where you're at risk of having floating debris clog it. But one of the beautiful things about my design is it's kind of pulling the water out in the same way that you pull water out of a septic tank. All the floaties yeah. have floated and all the sinkers have sunk. And so you're pulling water out of the middle where the water is the most clear. So now I'm, I'm open to the idea that this design could potentially still gum up and plug. And in which case it, it would need to be cleaned. But, and further, I've only built one of these. I built this one time on Mount Spokane years ago, and I have no idea how it performed over these years. But I gotta say that, I mean, there's an emergency overflow that's really huge. So, I mean, I'm not worried about the pond overflowing or anything like that. Um, it's, it's like, you know, the function of this is to add oxygen back into water for when the water is just moving just a trickle, which was the case in this particular pond. There was just a trickle of water that would come into the pond because it's a, it's a seasonal, it was a seasonal dribble of water. Okay. Um, Floating debris will clog it every fall, and that huge elbow in the dam will be hard, will be a hard stop to snake the drain. So I kind of feel like I think that there's so many filters on the intake. I don't think that's going to plug. I don't. Um, I'm, I just want to make sure I understand your design. It's using like two or three inch diameter, but basic hardware store plumbing parts that are used yeah. in the one, two, three, and four inch diameter in every house. And you can snake all the way to the septic tank. So you're not putting four elbows in it to change the direction. That would be a hard stop for a snake. 
Yeah, and it was a real gentle one too. And I'm not even, I don't think I even want to talk about snaking it. You know, yeah. no, don't, don't snake it. Uh, but it's like, there's no elbow there. It's, it's a very gradual thing. So basically I have um, a straight two inch pipe um, and then I've got a reducer going down to my one inch poly right. pipe. And then I just lay it on the dam in such a way that the two inch poly pipe goes over the apex and is starting to go downhill again into the pond where it gets to the reducer. And so there's no elbow. It's just a very gradual bit of water, but I've got the screen on the intake, which I think is gonna keep any chunky bits from getting in there. And so um, also you are draining right at the fish level. Your population will collapse Every spawn since the fry are way too weak to not be siphoned. And I kind of feel like, I think that the screen is going to keep them out pretty good. I think, I think the screen will be extremely thorough at, at uh, keeping them from going down, going, going through. And, it's, and plus, he's using the word siphoned. There's no siphon. That's why it goes to a bigger pipe is to prevent siphoning. So um, it, it has about the same amount of flow as something would over a rock line spillway. Exactly. Like I'm, exactly. I'm trying to I mean, comprehend this post and it's not making sense to me. So it's, I'll just let it's it not make sense. <laughs> it's kind of like it's a teeny tiny piped seal, a uh, spillway of sorts with stuff to prevent anything from siphoning. I, when I saw this, I felt like there was seven things wrong with this statement. And so, but clearly this person did make it through to get to this point. And it's like, somehow I was not being clear. There were, there were bits of information that I, I must not have said so that this person got this. So what the, the image in their head was different from what I was attempting to express. And so I felt like it was important to basically use this post to um, provide clarity in, in, in what I'm saying. So, okay, so it goes back up. I'm gonna go back up to um, floating debris will clog it every fall. Or was that the one or is it the one with the scuba gear? Impossible to clean out without scuba gear. So um, I, I feel like I, I feel like it won't need to be cleaned out. Like I, I would like to think it'll continue to work um, without the need to, to clean it ever. But I, I suppose it's possible that that it could get gummed up with something like um, um, algae, maybe. maybe. Maybe algae will start to wrap all over it and gum it all up, in which case it'll stop. And then we've got to pull it out and, and, uh, and de-algae it. But I kind of feel like if you've got algae in your pond, I think you need to solve that problem. Um, and that's going to be adding a lot of carbon into your pond, which is going to be probably a lot of stump wood, a lot of logs. Uh, the old school way is to add a bale of barley straw. Uh, you could add other kinds of straw, but I I think that uh, the you know the best stuff to do is to add sticks and logs and things like that. Um, I know Sep uses a lot of stump wood. Um, all right, uh, floating debris will clog it. Nope, I don't think so. And there's no and the huge elbow in the dam will be hard to stop to snake the drain. There's no elbow. Uh, also, you are draining right out, right at the fish level. Yes, I am. Uh, actually, it depends on the fish. I'm draining at a level that's kind of low down, so there's less oxygen and it's colder. And some fish are kind of into that, but most fish are not. Your population will collapse every spawn. I think that the that the small fish prefer the warmer, shallower water. And, and, the, and also the warmer, shallower, more oxygen-rich water. I don't think, 
I don't think the small fish tend to go down to the deeper parts. All right. So um, any any questions about this uh, this YouTube comment? I guess I could see um, a rat who likes water slides climbing up the other side and making a nest annoyingly in the in the pipe somewhere. But actually, you didn't talk about, or maybe I didn't remember um, how you handle the other end, the outlet end. Is it just is it capped in any way, or is it just open? Is it under the water in the next one, ideally? Actually, uh, the design that I made was is that there'd be a wood trough and that um, the water would drain into the top of the wood trough and the wood trough would carry it to the next pond down. So that way there'd be water piddling into the wood trough, thus getting a good oxygen exchange in the water. And then it would travel down the trough and then dribble into the pond, giving it even more oxygen exchange. So you're, you're, that's cool. I, I, I could see how some animal might be thinking about, you know, trying to get up there, but I would, I would think that it's not, it's not very hospitable for an animal in any way, I don't think. But you're right, it's possible an animal could get up there and plug it. It's true. I just, I guess, but I, I I know that with the one I had, I went several months of it operating without any problems whatsoever before going away from it. I, I do remember that I had a few other designs I did with my pond that are a bit different than what Sep talks about with his pond designs. Um, and, my, and I heard a report from somebody that was there the following fall or spring, the following spring, I think it was. Yeah, the following spring. And they said the whole pond was just, it had turned completely black, clear, but black. And then when you would walk up to it, suddenly the water would just turn clear right there. And the blackness was millions of polywogs. And, uh, uh, I kind of feel like millions of polywogs is a powerfully awesome indicator of having made an excellent pond. That is, yeah, I agree. Because they're one of the more susceptible to all the toxic gick in the world. Yes, yes. So That's great. Yeah, I, I really don't think there would be any problem in clearing it out. And you definitely would not need a scoop of food clearing it out, even if you got a rare case rat. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like, um, I kind of feel like the only thing I could think of that might plug it at all would be algae. And um, I, I kind of feel like if you do have algae, then, then you got to, you need to solve your algae problem, really, then, you know, peel the algae off. Um, have I have I told you guys if I if I mentioned in the podcast the pat in the past about my story of Sep and the moss? Yes, <laughs> that's yes. a great okay. story. All right, all right. So I don't, I don't need to embarrass myself again by telling that one. All right, I'm ready to to move on with bits from the book. So we start on page eighty two cooperation with animals in and around the water. I reject intensive animal husbandry. This holds true for water landscapes. The vegetation and surrounding environment suffer from over-exploitation. The animals do not thrive when overcrowded. They get stressed and sick. Now, when I first stocked my first pond, uh, there was a guy a couple hours away, and then um, I got a huge tank and I put it uh, in the back of my truck, and I went to this guy's place and I bought a whole bunch of uh, rainbow trout. And he had, I don't know, eight or nine ponds full of different kinds of trout. And, uh, but he had all kinds of bubblers in there and each pond had 
way too many fish in there. But, you know, I had the kids with me, so they did what they do for kids is they grab a handful of the, the feed, you know, the fish feed, and they pitch it in there. And the fish, you know, go into a wild frenzy trying to get at it. And so the, the whole pond kind of comes to life with all these fish trying to get at the fish feed. But, I mean, it's like the fish were packed in those ponds so tight it's like uh, I would. Uh, I'm going to make a guess that for that that a good twenty percent of the volume of the pond was fish, and um, so the, I mean they are on top of each other. It is just nuts how packed they are. Um. I mean, if that guy didn't sell enough fish, I, I suppose a bunch of them might end up dying from, uh, you know, because they get bigger and bigger and bigger. The other thing is, is that my understanding is, is that what they call fish feed is, is some pretty gross stuff. So, um, uh, like, like, it doesn't, it's not going to meet our values. Whereas with Sep, he just stocks his pawns to much, much lower value. And it's kind of like he doesn't feed them anything. So they all they've got are the insects that happen to find their way over to the ponds or uh, whatever other stuff that the fish can eat. And that's it. If they can't, if if, if they can't get by on that, they're gonna be skinny fish. The end. That's all it is. All right, um, next up is pike in the carp pond. So he talks about fish stocking levels and, he, and he's emphatic about how the, the, the levels have to be low enough that they can sustain themselves. But then he talks, talks about pike in the carp pond. Now, um, I've heard Sepp speak so many times and I kept wondering if he's saying pike and it means some other variety of fish. Because every time he says carp, I keep thinking of goldfish and koi. You know, the, these ornamental fish that people keep. That they're a type of carp. But when he says pike, I'm kind of thinking like, does he mean something else? Like, is this a translation thing? But uh, so I went and I looked it up today for the first time ever. And, uh, and it's like, oh, okay. So pike and carp are both uh, uh, fish that are you know, pretty popular in Asia and in Europe. And, and most carp are considered um, uh, to be bad news in North America. And so they, they're trying to get rid of them. Uh, they're considered invasive. Um, but yeah, uh, so Opalin's bringing up some pictures of uh, pike. They are an odd looking fish there. I don't recall ever catching a fish that looks anything like this. <laughs> Clearly How do you a predator that? fish. Go ahead. Katie? How do you see the, the movie, the animated movie, The Stone? Uh, it's an old movie. Uh, Say it again. Part of the movie, they are The Sword in the Stone. By Disney, it's an animated Disney. In part of the movie, they are chased by a pike. If you were a young, that pike is a scary pike. Okay, that's the one where King Arthur is a boy named Wart, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, I I did see that a long time ago. I still remember there was a squirrel, um, but uh, oh, I guess it was far too long ago. I can't remember all the details. The important thing is, is that a pike is a, is a predator fish. I believe that a carp is a vegetarian fish. And so, um, but uh, so that the carp is going to be uh, eating a, uh, a variety of uh, plants and then the pike is gonna wanna eat the carp. And so now I don't feel so bad because when I looked all this stuff up earlier, it was kind of like, oh, these, these are fish that are 
not native to the area, not common to the area. And, uh, um, and I imagine that there's a bunch more to learn about them that I don't know yet. But uh, um, still, the, it does make this, this next bit is something that, can, that applies for any kind of aquaculture scenario. As always, diversity wins. It is possible to keep predatory and non-predatory fish in the same pond, especially when the pond is extensively used. People often ask, how does that work? Pike and carp in the same pond? The pike will eat all the carp. Nonsense. <laughs> this does not happen in nature either. Fish live off each other, but they do not exterminate each other. Only in a rectangular or circular pond with the same depth everywhere and no roots or rocks would this happen because the non-predatory fish would not have anywhere to hide. To keep the balance, the habitat needs to be diverse, giving each fish the living conditions they need to thrive. I create whole hills made of stones on the bed of the lake. I add tree trunks, even whole trees, and keep the vegetation along the banks diverse. This way, the young fish and non-predatory fish find enough spaces to hide. Some of the young fish serve as food for the predatory fish, but the other ones are for market and to stock the pond. The fittest survive and the system thrives. Birds also benefit from a mixed fish stock. Even big fish can get eaten by an otter, but the damage is limited with a diverse stock compared to a pond where all the fish are equally big and heavy. All right. Um, any, any comments about that bit? Next up is I really like he, how he talks. Go ahead, Oplin. Sorry, I wasn't sure if my mute button was on or off. I really like how he talks about diversity. And when I was studying rivers, there's the river of water, which is all we think about. And then there's the river of trees. And then there's the river of rock that gets moved. And so having rocks and trees and vegetation and different types of fish, which will bring different other predators, like as always, diversity wins. Right, right, right. And uh, I, I think not only does diversity win, but if you try to have something that looks like it's designed for a park, then um, that's, that's a big fail. Um, nature, nature has all kinds of trees and rocks and um, all kinds of stuff in the water. And, and that's what we need it to look like. Much more right. like this one. Yes. Yeah. Something something that looks untidy. Something that looks like, you know, it could like people might think of it as a big mess. See that one there, that one looks too tidy to me. I'd like to see more trees like in the water than what that picture is showing. All right. Uh, growth control. If I have a lake or pond which is connected to other open water, especially if it has a drainage system, I must make sure not to keep fish which could spread and harm the flora and fauna of the natural surroundings. This is obvious. These are non-native fish without natural predators. The drain needs to be protected to make sure that the fish will not swim in or out of the fishery. This prevents unwanted or sick fish settling in my pond and stops my fish from, from migrating elsewhere. 
There's no connection to other water systems, and the lake is only fed by rain and or groundwater. This is not necessary. All right, I, th I think that sounds like he's covering his ass in a lot of ways, but at the same time, it's totally true. Um, I know that there are uh, some lakes in Montana that are struggling with um, a bunch of introduced species of fish and they're wiping out the existing populations. Natural feed. A pond with a deep zone hardly ever freezes completely, which reduces stress for animals and plants, and thereby boosts natural food production. Fish only require additional feed when kept intensively, something I do not recommend. Naturally kept fish taste much better anyway. The quality of the water also influences the quality of the fish. When the water smells bad, so does the fish. A lake in a natural shape allows water movement and regenerates itself as described in detail on page 73. All right, and then there's this, this fascinating little practical tip in the purple box, mosquito trap. Hang a light bulb ideally a solar one, over a pond at night. It will attract lots of mosquitoes that in turn will attract fish. You can create a shallow zone underneath it by putting some rocks in the water. Then only the young fish can swim there and catch the mosquitoes and flies. A simple way of providing food for the fish and to reduce the mosquito population at the same time. I love how simple that is. And, and I, I also love that while I think I've studied this topic pretty thoroughly, and I know of a lot of little fun tricks, I have never heard of that trick before. All right, any, any comments about growth control or natural feed? I have a quick story. Um, we sometimes will get like a termite swarm <laughs> um, when the season first warms up every year. It, it gets a little warmer and a little cooler, a little warm. So there's a little, a little change and you can notice it. And when that happens, if there's termites in the area, that you'll have this just swarm of termites wanting to come into your house. So you close all the doors and windows, make sure they can't get in. But you can also put a light, like a strong work light or anything outside and all the frogs will come over and come in, in a circle around the light and they will just be eating and eating and eating the termites. It's kind of amazing to watch. So it's a little similar and the trick works in, in lots of circumstances. I, I think, uh, um, Katie, because you're in Hawaii, I, I think that uh, it might be fun one of these days to record a podcast just about Hawaii. I know that... Um, I, I've, uh, we've had some people here from Hawaii and they've shared their stories of gardening in Hawaii. And then um, there are other stories about just living in Hawaii. And I, I kind of feel like, uh, um, I mean, some people get dreamy about the idea of living in Hawaii and I, and I kind of feel like, oh no, there's, it's not all upsides. I think there's some powerful downsides you should be aware of before you go there and i think i've heard that a lot of people like move to hawaii and then before a year is up they move back um yeah. and so That's true. it would be good it, it might be good to to share all those little bits and bobs so that when people get there they know what they're getting into um so that would be a, i think that'd be a fun podcast one of these days we'll have to do that Oh, that'd be fun. Um, the, the mighty, the glorious, the amazing Seth Holster. When he says mosquitoes, does he mean just sort of little bugs in general? I've never known a mosquito to go towards light. Well, um, mosquitoes are famous. I mean, there's a, there's a, a contraption here in the States that's very popular. It's that uh, thing that's the, the, 
the bug zapper. It's got that blue light. And then, uh, you know, the, the mosquitoes go to it and they pop. Yeah, but I got one of those and you have to put a little mosquito pack at the bottom or the mosquitoes don't come over. Either. Oh, so it's just other bugs that come. Yeah. Yeah, that if you if you put that outside, the frogs like to go under there and eat the crispy ones. <laughs> so um, I think that's a possibility. Uh, maybe maybe if Sep were to observe a little closer, you would see that it's not so much mosquitoes. I would have to say that, uh, I mean, here, uh, both of you have been here, how, and you're both, both of you were here, no, wait. I think Opalyn, when you were here, it was fall and it was fairly yep. cold. And so not exactly mosquito season. No. But Katie, you were here in mosquito season. And so how many mosquito yeah. bites well, did you get? None. And I am a mosquito magnet. I get all the bites. And, and so you must have been putting all that mosquito pucky on every day. Not at all. Not a bit. <laughs> I don't even do it here. I just wear yeah, lots of we clothes just, and everyone's frozen. We just don't have... <laughs> We just don't have mosquitoes. And uh, I mean, they're, they're here, but it's like, uh, I, I don't know, people working outside all day, they might end up with two mosquito bites for the whole summer. That's, that might be it. Wow. You don't have a lot of standing water going on. Yet. We're, 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 we'll install some soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I must be wrong because this is Seth Holter and he, he knows what he's talking about. But if it's a translation error, he can't be blamed for that. Right, we gave him an out. <laughs> I do have a porch light, and I have never seen a mosquito hanging out on the porch light. And I have fascinating variety of moths and other winged creatures that that like that area. So I I'd, I'd say it's a translation, not yeah, not specific okay. to mosquitoes. So yeah, lots of insects, but but you're right. I I. I, to me, the, the thing, when I think of like what captures mosquitoes, I think of the Dan Rojas video um, where he had a box fan, or was it even more powerful than that? It was um, a, big, uh, a, a big fan, and of course, Oakland's already got the images up, and then he puts like a screen on the fan. It's a very oh, powerful oh. fan. And then like he gets a quart of mosquitoes off of it every night that it's i just, believe it's just crazy wow. the amount of mosquitoes he gets um i have actually oh. what's that katie what? speaking of hawaii stories i have actually seen a mosquito land on and apparently bite a mango so they seem to also like fruit <laughs> Oh, all right then. Um, okay, I so yeah, we don't have a lot of mosquitoes here, but of course, you know, and I and I do think, I mean, there is, I gotta say that we, there is there is a BB about controlling mosquitoes, and I think we've got like fifteen hours, maybe even twenty hours, uh, wrapped up in in that. And I think we came up with some really good stuff that's because we kind of kept coming into these spaces of like, what are short term solutions, but we kind of felt like permaculture is about really long term solutions. Like what are things that you can do uh, to control mosquitoes that lasts for years, you know, uh, instead of something um, that's that's like uh, uh, just this one time. I'm going to do this one thing one time and then I'm all done. So things that are going to be more like bird habitat, toad habitat, um, uh, you know, uh, resolving things about standing water in different ways, uh, stuff like that. So, um, all right, I'm going to move along to temperature. Heat requirements vary from fish to fish. Brown trout cannot tolerate temperatures above 22 to 23 degrees Celsius. And 25 degrees is the upper limit for rainbow trout. Carp, on the other hand, just start feeling comfortable at these temperatures. 
fish need more oxygen in warm water. I thought that was kind of interesting, but at the same time, I would imagine that the fish would be more active in warm water. I, I get the impression that when fish, like fish kind of hibernate in the winter, they go to where the cold water is, and there's not a lot of oxygen in the cold water, but they also sort of hibernate yet remain moving through the winter. And they, they continue to have water pass through their gills. Um, that's my understanding of hibernating fish. Reproduction and fish kindergartens. I do not need to worry about fish reproduction in a naturally built lake. All I need to do is to ensure that there are enough sheltered spots for spawning. In order to protect the offspring, I create fish kindergartens by placing rocks, trees, or scrub in the shallow zones that create a safe, play, a safe space for the young fish to mature. These provide plenty of food and the predatory fish cannot get in. Various fish have different needs for spawning grounds. Pike spawn next to the grass by the bank. Xander spawn in deep or shallow zones, usually next to roots. You can help them by building nests for them. I tie fine roots to twigs and branches and hang them one to two meters deep in the pond. Trout need shallow zones with running water and a bed of gravel or sand. They travel up to the inflow of the lake and create little hollows with their fins in which they leave their eggs. These are then immediately fertilized by the male trout and the hollows are closed off again. The hollow needs constant flowing water, otherwise the eggs go moldy. That is why trout seek the inflow to a lake. The spawn live off their yolk bags until as youngsters, they can start eating mosquitoes and other small animals. I think another thing to keep in mind is that um, when you have shallow water, and my understanding is, is generally shallow standing water, um, there is a microorganism called Daphne which I think is the name of the woman in the Scooby-Doo stuff. Daphne. I could be mistaken. But anyway, this Daphne, um, these are these small organisms that just thrive like crazy in still shallow water. And it's like, for a lot of fish, it's half the food that they eat mm. or more is the Daphne. All right. Any questions about any... Uh, Anything on pages 84 or 85, the reproduction of fish kindergartens or natural feed or temperature? Nothing. There's a big section in here on waterfowl, but I kind of feel like um, I, I need to not read too much of the book in. And, and this is a good time to remind people, go buy the book. <laughs> um, then there's a section on water buffalo. And he talks about how awesome it is to have water buffalo, then water gardening. Um, then he goes into other economic uses, and uh, he talks about uh, the, the tourism uses. Uh, I think that there's a lot to be said for tourism, and I and I kind of feel like um, in you know when people start talking about making money with permaculture, I kind of feel like um, you would be far wiser to do tourism than most of the uh, poverty stuff that most people explore doing. And then he goes into this fascinating thing, which I kind of feel like the images here might not be fully correct. The ring water feeder a model 
for supplying cities and communities with living water. And so I had to read this a couple of times and I'm still not certain I fully understand it, but it sounds like the idea is, is that in every home, there's water that, that, is, that is flowing 24 seven. So like, and I'm not like, for, I wanna use the example of a kitchen sink, but I think, I think based on what I'm reading here, I think a kitchen sink wouldn't work. And so the idea is, is that the water is always flowing. So the water comes out of the sink and it's always running. Only I think that there has to be like two basins, one that's the, the clean basin and one that's the dirty basin. I had a slightly different interpretation. Okay. So um, there, there's a diagram that shows it goes from the well up to a big containment and the water runs in this big circle and down to a, another, a second containment that's like 40 meters lower in elevation. And right. as the water gets to the faucet, there's a, a pipe. It, it's sort of a T. So instead of the water going to the faucet and it's either on or it's off, there's a T and water can either go out the faucet if you turn it on or follow the T back into the ring of water that's circulating. So it'd be exactly the same as the water system is now, only instead of the water going one way into the system on the far end of the system, we would collect that water back up and move it move it back up into like, I don't know, like there's a water tower, we would recirculate it. We would keep it moving. Yeah, and so the, the water in the, the second basin, he calls it, is lower in elevation and that gets pumped or can get pumped back up to the upper basin or flow out into a pond. So there's always fresh water entering the system from the well. Uh -huh maybe not 24 seven, but for example, um, one of the wells I'm familiar with, it's turned on for like one minute or two minutes every 15, so that the water is flowing into the cistern regularly to keep some of that movement that SEP's trying to gain by this system. Um, and, but this, this section I found really fascinating. And I, I read it three or four times just because I was like, wow, how do we do this? Because it's three pages long. And that's like, wow, that's healthy living real water that hasn't been tampered with that's coming into every home that, on the system. And I just found that really encouraging that somebody had like figured out how to do it. So now I'm kind of rereading a piece of it. And, and he's saying that it's like, okay, let's say there's water going into a house. That same house would also have water, like, like clean water coming back out to continue in the system. Yeah. And it's like, um, I, I originally thought that what he was saying is, is like, there would be a water feature in the house where the water would come out of the pipe and then it would wiggle its ass at people and then go back into the system but i'm i'm this one little bit that i'm reading it kind of sounds like no 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 it all stays in the pipe the whole time and it's just that rather than the, the water going up to the house and if no one's using water right now the water just sits in the pipes and waits that instead of that, there's um, two pipes going to the house, one that puts the water in and then the water does a lap around the house and then comes back out. And so the water is constantly flowing through the house. And if nobody uses it, it just goes the amount of water that comes out the out pipe is exactly the same as the amount of water going in the in pipe. 
But if somebody uses it, then less water comes out the outpipe. I think that's what's being proposed here. That's what I read. And so there's there's the clean water outpipe, and then there's the dirty water outpipe, which we're all used to of our sink drain. Okay. And that could be a gray water system or something yes. like that. Which, by the way, I, I think that the uh, the gray water says the gray water and willow feeder stuff that is a, a PEP, the whole PEP program for that, I think turned out really amazing. And I kind of feel like if anybody would ever look at that, um, I, th I, think, uh, I think it's very powerful. And I have so much to say about that, but that's another podcast for another day. Um, all right, so um, he's basically saying, rather than having water get to your house into the pipes, and then it just sits there. So like if you're gone for the day and then you come back and you go get a glass of water, the glass of water that you're getting has been sitting in the pipes for all day. And he's saying, ew, no, no, don't, 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 don't drink that. No. Instead, what, what he wants you to do is to have water that goes through the house constantly and then when you go to get a glass of water, whatever water you're getting is, it's like, um, it's, it's probably no more than a few minutes old, even if yeah. you live in a city. And it's like, it's been, and, and in fact, uh, 10 seconds ago, the water in your glass, 10 seconds ago, it was moving. It was living. All right, then on, on page 90, he's got a picture of uh, these two vessels, these two clay vessels, many drinking this vessels like these in Spain are egg shaped. This allows best water movement. I'm not sure how, how he's thinking that they're moving inside of there, but every time you pick it up, like the water is able to move around and interact with itself. Whereas okay. if there's square edges, there's still areas that don't or move, move or get less movement. Yeah, that's one of the things he's making uh, pretty clear. In fact, a uh, basin construction, water is a living being. The basins should not have corners or dead zones because the water would not move in these and would start to decay. Egg or calabash shapes are best. What's a calabash shape? Want to look sort of like up? the image I have on the screen. And it's a bit of an egg shape with the pointy end down and the pointed part is cut off so it'll sit there stable. OK. All right, all right. Egg uh, the egg shape also offers the highest stability and prevents problems with statics. Right. So these. So now you're you're scrolling past a bunch of images that are kind of egg shaped. Yeah, egg shaped clay water vessels is what you did for. Okay. Um, one big mistake is often made. People put electricity, internet, or phone cables in the same trench as the water pipe. This is very dangerous. And I think, I think he's not even talking, I mean, he does go on to mention a moment later, like electricity and water don't mix really well. You know, like if the water got out and got on your electricity, that could be a bad day. But I think what he's trying to say is, is that because uh, he goes on to say water carries information. And so he's trying to say that this other, like the electricity and then the other, the wires, the, those other things, they're going to screw up the information that's in the water. And so that is bad. Don't do that. It is important to remember that each household needs an incoming and an outgoing pipe for fresh water 
and a drain pipe for the used water. This will keep the water alive and fresh at all times, and nothing else is needed to treat the water. And that concludes chapter two. So I have a question on page 90. <clears throat> so I'll read the paragraph. It says basin one has an overflow connected to a pond. So the basin that's at a higher elevation, water which is not needed is fed into the pond. The delivery of the well, however, is so strong that the water from basin two is not needed as basin two will need the overflow. I'm sort of wondering if they got confused about which basin they were referring to there. Maybe it's part uh, of this diagram where the words are so small you can't read it. And I think they're not in English. Oh, so it doesn't matter. You can't read it. You would just, you would just be annoyed. Okay. Basin one has an overflow connected to a pond. All right. Water which is not needed is fed into the pond. The delivery of the well, however, is so strong that the water from basin two is not needed as basin two would need it. Yeah, I'm going to say probably a typo. Okay. Because in the first drawing on page 89, it shows that the overflow from basin two can be pumped up to basin, back up in elevation to basin one. Yeah. So, right. Okay. And he mentions in the text how it would be preferable if that was like solar or wind powered pumping. Any other comments about all of chapter two? There's just a lot of great stuff in this book and we've read about 90 pages so far and I'd say it's really worth getting your hands on a copy of this book. I know it may not be in print right now and may be hard to get your hands on, but go buy the book. Go buy the book. I wonder if the book is available in England. Like, can you go and buy it from England and then you have to pay like some kind of crazy amount of shipping to get it? So like, you know, um, wow. I know that it's, it's permanent publications. So surely the permanent publications themselves sells it, right? I mean, you could buy there's it a directly. Copy, there's a copy for $105 used <laughs> online. Yeah, I know. You could sell your paper copy for $100 and then buy like four or five <laughs> copies of the digital version. My, uh, I, had, I had two copies of Sepulcher's Permaculture and uh, they're both gone now. And so I uh, went online and thought I'm going to, because basically how it goes like this. There's somebody who's here and they want to borrow it. Oh, look at that. See, it's 16 pounds, right? And out of print. Out of print. Oh, bummer. Okay. Um, so then uh, uh, somebody comes and they say, can I, can I look at that? And I say, sure, just don't let it leave the building. And then uh, I had two copies. They're both gone now. And then somebody said, can I, don't, don't you have Sepulcher's Permaculture? And I would say, I used to. <laughs> and because they're like, I want to look at it. And it's kind of like, I bet you do. It's a good book. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't have it anymore. And so I went online to go look at it. And it's like, it was $30. Um, and I think the price has come down a little bit since then, but I'm kind of, and I also uh, tried contacting Chelsea Green to ask him, like, what if I bought 24 copies? I just had a pile of copies. And, uh, and they were like, still going to be like 20 bucks a copy or something like that. And I kind of thought, yeah, I'll just, I'll just let it go. I'm just, There's I don't know, one some... copy for 10 bucks. Apparently. Yeah. If it's really legit. Yeah. I mean, isn't that what Mark was talking about last time he would order it and then after a couple of weeks, get a full refund because of whatever. Right. Oh, look, see, people also search for that guy. Do you see that over there? Lower right hand corner. <laughs> you hey, search Paul. for, yes. 
would you say that it would be a good gift if people were to send you copies of Seth's book so that when people come, you would have giveaway copies or lend away copies? Um, I, I, I feel so strongly about the book that I like the idea of there being books. I mean, part of it was, is what is, I mean, we had a bunch of people that were here for Christmas and I believe that I was awesome as a gift giver at Christmas. Um, and then, you know, we did talk about our half-assed holidays. We had magnificent half-assed holidays. Um, but one of the things I thought of doing was giving everybody a copy of the book since we didn't have any copies at all here. And I thought, well, maybe I could get 24 copies and each Christmas I could give people a copy of the book. And, but we'll always have a copy standing by. And then um, if somebody steals a copy of my book, then, um, uh, you know, I'll have a few more as backup. I mean, I do kind of feel like, I mean, when I, when we do these, page by page book reviews, I mark the book up a lot. I mean, I draw right in the book. And, um, and I kind of feel like when I go back and look at the book, I'm glad that I drew in it because then I can remember to find what I'm looking for. It's the stuff that I, that I marked up. And uh, so I'm kind of a little pissy that somebody took away my copy that I marked up for doing the, the book review, you know? That is a bummer. Um, it sounds like you said, you're saying that people should send you copies of these books because then you could hide away your private collection and have some borrowy <laughs> copies in the, in the other room. I, I, yeah, we've got the library, which has tons of books in it. I uh, really love the idea of the, of the library getting more and more books. Um, and, uh, and I would like it. And then I've got like one copy of several books in my library that are all books I bought. I don't have everything, but I do get people who send me some stuff. So I have both of Mark Shepard's books and they were uh, both sent to me by uh, two different people. And in both cases, they are hoping that I'm going to do this chapter by chapter review for Mark's books. And um, I, I kind of like the idea of doing that. And um, uh, especially as more recent book sounds like, I mean, only just based on the title, I'm like excited to read it. Uh, Water for Every Farm. Um, uh, you know, I, I really like the idea of uh, the permaculture technology jamboree, which by the way, one of the things we're gonna do here is we're gonna make a spring terrace, a sepulcher spring terrace here. And not only are we going to make a Sepulcher Spring Terrace, but the guy that's leading it is Alan Booker. And so it's like, you know, it isn't going to be some half-assed Spring Terrace. That's so that's, exciting. Yeah. And that's part of the PDJ. But I kind of feel like if the PDJ does well this year, then um, I, I kind of like the idea that uh, sometime in the future, we do something that's instead of a two week long PDJ to do something that's more like uh, a four week long PDJ. And instead of 10 tracks, maybe it'll be like 12 or 14 tracks. And that the big projects will be things like natural swimming pools. And Woo! we'll do a, and, and we'll do a lot more stuff with how to generate water on the farm, like the spring terraces, like, like the humus wells, like the air wells. And, um, and then it's also like, let's see if we can create a creek, like make a, make a creek appear where there's never been a creek before using uh, um, all the techniques uh, that we have at our disposal. And I mean, like I could, I could fill a few podcasts just talking about the ideas I have about an event like this. Um, there's so much to talk about. Uh, um, and, but anyway, I, I kind of feel like what I would really, really like, and that's another thing too, is I feel like the PDJ, we need two more instructors still. And, and the idea is we'd like to have an instructor come in and, and cover three days worth of builds and we'll give them a free ticket to the, all the rest of the event in exchange. And it's kind of like our chance to kind of get to know instructors 
and see, see how we like them, see if they're a good fit for us. Because we've had some instructors here where it's like, this, this didn't work out. And so we just don't work with them. And I feel like that's kind of how it has to be. You got to bring people in and try it out and see how it goes. Um, and if it's good, then, then keep having them come back and we'll do more and more and more. Um, and at the same time, we have a lot of old favorites coming back that are going to teach big chunks of this event. So, you know, the, the reliable folk. Um, I, I think, I mean, one of the things that we're talking about here is that uh, two of the boots are gonna be leading the build for the Solarian project. And so um, uh, I, I'm, Dave, that we talk about it all the time now because, you know, this will be their first big build of this, of this sort. And so, but I kind of feel like with the PDJ, I love the idea that we can have some builds going on that are led by um, experts in the field and other builds going on that are maybe not experts, but they're up there a ways, you know. I, I think that we have a lot of pretty strong in-house expertise at this point on some topics. And so um, I'm, I'm just kind of feeling like it'll be a great event. But we got to... We got to have a, a magnificent event this year. So we've got a few more tickets available for sale and we could use a couple more instructors because there's a lot of instructors to pull off an event like this. Paul, but I was yeah, curious if water you stuff could... and futures. Go ahead, Opalyn, go ahead. Um, are, are there specific tracks that need instructors so that people could think about, hey, that really fits me or doesn't fit me that you might share? I, I do believe that right now, um, like I think I'm meeting with Lara later today to talk about how do we find an instructor for the pavilion. And so it's a roundwood timber framing project. Um, and basically we've had some, uh, we had everybody lined up for last year, but then of course, you know, coronavirus stuff. And then, right. uh, and most of those people just copied and pasted over to this year. And, um, uh, but some people, it's like uh, this thing happened and now I can't come. And some people, it's like it has to do with virus. Uh, one has to do with having a baby right at the same time. So don't think it's good for me to be there for that. Um, and uh, little bits and bobs is uh, hum human stuff. Um, so uh, I think I think Lara's come up to speed really great as an event coordinator. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of like, all right, so the pavilion, some roundwood timber framing. For a while, I thought we had a line on somebody, but I, I, that sounds like it's, it's probably not going to happen. So we need to, that person's a, maybe a plan C. We need to find a plan A person. So roundwood timber framing would be great. Um, uh, but mostly we need somebody who's going to just own a project and see it through to the end. And uh, uh, we can help fill in some of the gaps with our in-house expertise on this one. So um, just show up a few days early and we'll, we'll get all the details ironed out. We'll make sure all the materials are lined up and go from there. I mean, we still need a good strong design for the pavilion project. But um, so that's an example of one of the projects where we, I know we need to have an instructor. So yeah, um, I, I kind of, somebody with roundwood timber ex, uh, expertise would be best. And, uh, not, but it's even more than that. You gotta, you gotta at least have some understanding of our values. Like we don't use plywood. We, we use like less than 1% of the glue and paint that other builds would have. Um, you know, I don't know, there's a lot of things we just, we prefer using wood from our land. I think that there could be other things put in too. Like, I don't think there's anything in the PDJ about the sawmill, but I kind of feel like, wouldn't everybody kind of like to get a few minutes on the sawmill, like maybe even a, an hour, um, just to kind of see what it's like? That'd be cool. Yeah. So, and um, I think I should say that, you know, since the Kickstarter is doing quite well, um, then uh, I think, you know, because we subsidize 
our events uh, with with funds from the Kickstarter. Oh, it went up a little bit again. <laughs> yes, it did. Um, and I got to say that with the Kickstarter, I have this massive collection of feelings about it. Um, on the one end of the spectrum, I'm so glad that we got funded at all. So the book is going to exist. And then I'm so glad that we got funded so fast, like in an hour and a half, we were funded. And I'm so glad about that. And, uh, and that it just kind of kept going up and up and up. And then and then in the early part, we just kept knocking out like a new stretch goal every few hours. That was so exciting. So glad about that. I'm so glad about how far we've come. And then, of course, you know, as with everybody running a Kickstarter or any author ever, it's kind of like, well, well, where am I falling short? Because there's other Kickstarters that bring in like $10 million. You know, um, uh, now granted, this Kickstarter is doing better than any of my previous Kickstarters, which is awesome, which is such an exciting feeling, such a good feeling. And at the same time, I, I think the I think it's pretty clear we're we're not going to be a million dollar Kickstarter. And uh, and I, you know, I kind of feel like, well, you know, how am I falling short? What am I doing wrong? What could I do better to be a million dollar Kickstarter? So, but that's mixed in with all of the stuff about how glad I am that we're funded at all. <laughs> so um, I'm, I, I just feel like this is a big warm message uh, where people are voting with their dollars to say that they believe in this program. I'm, I'm so, ex I'm, I'm so excited about that. I, I feel, I feel like Skip is going to be huge, and so I'm, I'm so glad that other people feel that way also. All right, I think I'm ready to wrap this up. Anything awesome. else? Any other bits and bobs? Nothing here. I think it's good. Thanks, Paul. Okay. If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the forums at permuse.com where we talk about the mighty, the glorious, the amazing settlers. Homesteading and permaculture all the time. All the time. All the time.